Now, one thing I do know is that if an MP stands up and talks nonsense about the armed forces and just doesn't know what they're talking about, nothing annoys them more when they're watching the telly in some faraway place. They think this, this, this woman, this man, hasn't the slightest idea as to what a warrior is or what it's like, you know, and, and so on. My name is Johnny Ball, and I'm the founder of Campaign Force, a not-for-profit that inspires, trains, and coaches the armed forces community to stand up and serve again. I've served on the front line of military operations and in civilian life, the front line of UK politics. This Veterans in Politics podcast is a set of interviews brought to you by Campaign Force and sets out to explore how the military community can help make our politics a better place. I lean into my little black book of contacts and sit down with individuals from across the world of politics, sharing secrets, giving tips and advice and inspiring the next generation. We are Campaign Force. This is the Veterans in Politics podcast. Let's introduce you to our guest. Our guest is Liberal Democrat defence spokesman Jamie Stone MP. Jamie served in the then TA, in his words, ages ago, but currently is a member of the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme, a scheme designed to keep MPs abreast of military matters from first-hand experience. They talk about this programme, the political hero, the late, great Paddy Ashdown, and a story about how Jamie got jailed during his time in training, a story you don't want to miss. It's time for you to meet our guest. Jamie, welcome to Veterans in Politics. I'm absolutely delighted to have you on. Uh, been, uh, it's great to meet you virtually, albeit at the uh, end of last year. Uh, but how are you today? I'm fine, actually. It's, it's, uh, it's a wee bit cold in the north of Scotland, but I'm in good trim. And... Um... I have to be grateful for small mercies. Well, you've, you've certainly got the right jacket on. Uh, that's all I can say. I'm pretty got jacket envy. But um, yeah, I just said, bought it on eBay. It's my new flying jacket. Sorry, you know, very proud. <laughs> well, it's quite fitting, really, considering our audience is the armed forces community. Um, but um, so we'll get onto that a little bit later on during this chat. But um, one thing I was reading up about you, actually, is that you've got a friend called Oil Rig Pete. And I'm absolutely obsessed with the background to this guy. And he said of you, God knows how you ever became a member of parliament. But you are a member of parliament and you've served as a local councillor and MSP. So why did you get involved in politics in the first place? And can you tell us a little bit about Oil Rig Pete? Because he sounds fascinating. Well, OK. Um, it's, it's a funny reason, it's twofold. First of all, my dad, who I loved very much, was a local captain. He, uh, he died a little younger than he should have done, really. Um, he'd lived life to the full, perhaps a little bit too much to the full, you know, the fags, the whiskey. So when he died, there was a by-election to the council. And for all the wrong reasons, emotion, all of that, I stood for his seat, because I couldn't bear to see, you know, not be dads, if you like, and I won it. And that started me off. And the second thing is, um, through that, I got to know Charles Kennedy, and I was actually found, I found Charles Kennedy to be completely inspirational, totally different sort of politician, and it was he who said to me years and years ago, look, there's going to be a new Scottish Parliament, why don't you stand for it? So that is the simple answer. Um, two people made a difference to my life, but when I was with Pete doing the oil stuff, oh boy, was he some character, um, there was no notion of my being in politics. And, you know, I'd have roared with laughter at the thought of it. I was just a guy in a hard hat, steel toe cap boots, working at Kishorn or at Nig or up at Salem Bow, you know, like so many thousands of other people of my generation um, in Scotland did and still do today. Wow. Well, it's an amazing start to a political career. And actually, you do hear those sad but also inspiring stories where sadly a member of the family who is a politician passes away and then the family stepping up and fulfilling uh, that kind of obligation and continuing their service and to see how that's led on to bigger bigger things even for in your career is really fascinating and but but you were in the armed forces as well i know you've got a strong interest in military issues and you have served yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about your military background and your links to the armed forces community? Well, I was, uh, when I was at school, I was a, a naval cadet, if you like, 
But in actual fact, uh, about the same time as I was working at NIG, uh, with my, my hard hat and my steel toe cap boots, I um, got interested in the Territorial Army and joined the TA. Um, I was not a great soldier. I was a private soldier. I didn't advance beyond that. But I was in the 2nd Battalion of the 51st Highland Volunteers. I was in C Company. I was in the Mortar Platoon. And every Thursday we had a drill night and on the weekends we went away and, and did stuff. And you know what? I loved it. There was a sort of camaraderie about it. Um, it taught me to read a map. By goodness me, it taught me to read a map. Uh, better than a lot of other people can, actually, because that's how thorough the armed forces are. I also loved the TA because there was a sort of a flatness about the society of it. When the drill night on Thursday was over in Dingwall, uh, we would all go for a drink, it, you know, and it would be the captain, Captain Alistair Oak, right down to me, Private Stone. We'd all, you know, get, get a, a drink together. And that I found was really very unusual and rather nice, actually, to say the very least. Um, and eventually I did this. Uh, and then I got married. And then, as so often happens, a wife, little baby coming along, I had to give it up. But I've never forgotten. I don't pretend for one second to disturb, disturb any distinction. But you know something, the other day, because I'm doing the armed forces scheme through Westminster, I got into a conversation with the 3rd Battalion of the Yorks uh, in Estonia. And I, I was such oh, I was reminiscing, saying, well, now, I didn't get much further on the section attack, but the gun group would go right flanking, you double forward. I remember uh, skirmishing by half section. And if you had the jimpy, it was really hard work. And actually, infantry tactics have changed, but not that much. Um, and I found myself really enjoying going back down the memories. And just one thing was that I thought, well, now, wait, I, let me see if I can still present arms. Of course, with an SA-80, it's entirely different uh, to, to, to the, the good old SLR that we used to use back in those days. But it made a difference in my life. It gave me sort of a, a kind of a structure. So if I have to, even in politics, have to think something through, what am I going to do in this question I asked one today of Ben Wallace? And that little bit of military training, okay, just as a private soldier, but it made for clear thinking. And I, I think that was invaluable for politics, actually. It's been very useful. Sounds like it. And you mentioned that you're on the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that programme and what benefits you think that brings to parliamentarians? Well, it's a really good programme. It's been on the go for some time. What happens is they take about 30, perhaps even 40 MPs. Uh, you, you volunteer for it. And then you're issued with a uniform from Wellington Barracks. And you then either do Navy, Royal Air Force or, or the Army. And you have to do so many days actually with that particular service. So last time I did the Royal Air Force one, and what it meant was I went, uh, was sent out to Estonia to see what's happening out there, sent a number of Air Force bases. What's really interesting about it is you just wear the basic uniform. You don't have uh, any mark of rank. And the idea is when you mess, you, you mix up with absolutely uh, private soldiers like I was once upon a time. And uh, it's, it's sort of, not hide the fact you're an MP, to make sure you're down, or not down, that's the wrong word, but you're at the same level. And people talk freely, and you say, well, what's it like? And there's a kind of a deal that you learn things. For instance, in one particular place, we, we discovered that the, the washing machines, there weren't enough of for the this was for the infantry action in the army. So what you don't do is go back to the commons and say, I'd like to ask the Secretary of State, why there aren't enough washing machines in X, Y, Z place? Because you would then, you might blow the cover of the guys who told you. So there's a gentleman's agreement that you don't just, you know, drop the minute by saying, well, what are you going to do about this or that? But you remember it. And at some future time, you can start to press uh, the Secretary of State for Defence about housing conditions, about washing machines or whatever. But you don't want to get too specific. Um, and I suppose just to, I'm giving you very long answers, but it's pretty challenging because uh, last, you know, the year before last, I was, they were short of people for the Royal Navy one. So they sent me up to... Uh, joined the Royal Marines at Bardufoss, uh, uh, well above the Arctic Circle. And I can tell you, for a bloke in his 60s, having to do all this walking through the snow, uh, falling to snow drifts, um, sleeping in a bell tent at minus 28, uh, uh, that was really something. And I remember, you know, you did not dare stick your nose out of your triple sleeping bag, otherwise it would fall off. And I remember thinking, you are a silly old twit to do this at your age. What do you think you're doing? Um, and, you know, they made Scran for us, which is the Navy, where they mix everything up together. 
But it was a jolly, jolly good laugh, actually. And um, once you broke the ice a bit and sitting around a fire with your backside was frozen because it's minus 28, your, your front was being toasted because you were so close to flames. We actually got a really good laugh out, out of the lads, if you like. And one of them says, well, what's all this politics about then? I'm going to join the Lib Dems. No, I'm going to join Labour. What is the difference anyway? And it was a really upfront discussion, which I think was very healthy. And I think the politicians loved it. I think actually on that Arctic one, I, I think I like to think that our Royal Marines enjoyed it too. We had a lot of laughs, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, I think it's one of those schemes that not many people are aware of how members of parliament can get out there. Often MPs are accused of being out of touch, but I think this is one of those examples where you're very in touch with a, a section of society. Obviously you have an empathy from your own background with the armed forces. Um, but I think for those in particular that have zero background, it gives them a real opportunity to engage with the armed forces, to listen, to experience the actual life. And, you know, when we're not trying to pretend to make soldiers out of members of parliament, but I just think it's a really good way to, to build that empathy with the armed forces community. And that perhaps that's best practice for other areas of professions or society that, the parliamentary scheme could branch into and it's fantastic to see to hear those stories and and i think you definitely would have had an impact on those raw marines as you were sat around uh, enduring the same austere conditions but i think you're am i right in saying you are i think you're the most senior um, liberal democrat with a military background and did you hold the shadow defense brief is that right Yes, I did. Um, yeah, I have done since I was elected three years ago. Well, I started off as a sort of assistant defence to Lord Campbell, Ming Campbell, but he decided to give it up. So I've done defence ever since. And it's really, really interesting. Um, and as you say, the armed forces scheme uh, has been fantastic because because you have the personal relationship with the people who actually are out there, who are actually, you know, they're putting their lives on the line to defend our country. So you think very, very seriously in a debate about what does this mean for the people I have met? And, uh, you know, and some I've got to know. Um, and just to re-emphasize the point that, you know, you are no different from the, 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 you know, the private soldier, the able seaman, whatever, because, you know, we had six MPs sharing a room in bunks. And I remember Wayne David um, from CAF Philly saying in his Welsh accent, you snore, you know. And am I allowed to just tell a slightly naughty story? Is that acceptable? If you're happy for it to go out to broadcast, absolutely. Well, okay. Three sleeping bags, minus 28 in the belt tent. I have a colonel who's nothing to do with the armed forces scheme, who's also doing the same thing as us, an infantry colonel. That's by the bar. You dare not go for a pee in the night. So I broke all the rules and didn't have anything to drink after one o'clock the previous day. Not supposed to do that. So, you know, I just didn't fancy going out, having to put on the overshoes and falling over in the snow. Um, so I hung on, let's just leave it at that. And when morning came, oh, enough of that. So Wayne David, carefully in the next door tent says, ah, well, he says, I went, to, I went to the toilet the night. I said, no, you didn't, you didn't shift out your sleeping bag. He said, no, I used my flask. I thought, oh, I wish I'd thought of that. And so what did you do with it? He said, I put it beside you to see if you drink it in the night. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to edit that but it's a true story <laughs> brilliant that's amazing um so uh, um, but on, on that scheme well it sounds like you're um, you're definitely one over but it definitely has a you know a even though that light-hearted story it definitely has a serious effect on the way that we can get our MPs to really think about some of these key decisions around the armed forces um what do you um obviously the late great paddy ashdown is probably the most famous veteran from the liberal democrats and you know we miss him miss him so much in our politics um what do you think the lib dems can do uh, to really engage more with the armed forces community you think having had such a huge figurehead in the past of, of paddy ashdown well that's right i mean paddy was amazing and you know he had a real hands-on career in the armed forces as we know he was a royal marine and you don't get much tougher than that. Um, I think what we can do as a party is a bit like the armed forces scheme, is a bit more direct engagement with uh, our, our, our personnel, if you like. Now, one thing I do know is that if an MP 
stands up and talks nonsense about the armed forces and just doesn't know what they're talking about. Nothing annoys them more when they're watching the telly in some faraway place. They think this, this, this woman, this man, hasn't the slightest idea as to what a warrior is or what it's like you know, and, and so on. Or what it means, to give you an example, if you find the naffy has been shut on Christmas Day because you, you know, on your base because you haven't got anywhere to run it because of changes in the rules. Um, so I think what the Lib Dems can do is absolutely stay in touch. And if, if, if I'm left in the role, that's something I tend to, to play up. And uh, it's really important to build up the trust element. Um, I think also that, um, I think the Lib Dems duty is to build that up and always speak from an authoritative base you know what you're talking about. But I think is to, I think as a party, is to try and be supportive of our armed forces because it would be lovely if the world was a safe place, but it ain't. There are countries out there, there are people out there who'd like to do us major damage. But okay, it's maybe shifting to cyber, it's, it's shifting to space and so on, but you are kidding yourself if you think that uh, the, out there they have the UK's best interests at heart because they don't. And ultimately you have to have the ultimate sanction which is to defend our country. Therefore, I think uh, as a party, we have to demonstrate we're absolutely genuine about this. And um, I think it's something I hope I can in my small way, having only been a private soldier, but the private soldier is the basis of the British army. Uh, I hope I can contribute something to that. And um, I sincerely hope that Sir Edward Davy, my, le my leader, leaves me in the job. I, I think he might, but you never know in politics. Brilliant. Well, having you um, in the party and being able to be the voice within the party of the armed forces is definitely going to be beneficial for all of our community. And, um, and of course, being from Scotland and living in Scotland, um, your your nation has a very close affinity to the armed forces community both strategically and culturally indeed i've served on operations alongside certain elements of uh, scottish regiments very proudly and i mean with the ongoing scottish referendum debate and i was educated um at some stage around this that it's never gone away what's different this time and um, what do you think is likely to happen in the future around the scottish referendum I don't know, but I don't sense there's a, there's a big sea change in Scotland, actually, compared to the last referendum. Um, I think that the what is interesting is that the COVID uh, pandemic, awful as it is, might have slightly changed the dynamic. I think it's below the radar. I think just as people, you know, the pollsters are getting elections wrong, I sense that the public see that um, we're beating COVID with a national UK wide effort. The vaccine, the Oxford one, it's, it's Matt Hancock who's talking about the vaccine. And today, Ben Wallace, uh, the Secretary of State for Defence, was talking about the, what the armed forces are doing, uh, have done in the past about protective equipment, have done about testing, and now what they can do about the rollout of the vaccine. And you realize that the armed forces that the, 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 is part of the sinews of the UK. And I think what I'm saying to you is, I think the general public kind of understand that. Now, if Scotland votes for independence, I'm still a Scot, I shall li li live in my hometown of Tain, where I'm speaking for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say, ooh, like that, throw my toys out the window. But I feel in my bones that I don't think independence is going to happen. Um, I may be proved wrong, in which case, of course, I should accept the result with good grace. But um, I think there's been a bit of a sea change on that front. and. At the end of the day, if you go in my hometown here, or you go, you know, anywhere in Scotland, and you talk about the Royal Regiment of Scotland, there's enormous pride. There's enormous pride in Lossiemouth. There's enormous pride in, in, in what the Royal Navy does. You think about the aircraft carriers at Scythe, you think about Fans Lane, all that. And when push comes to shove, and you say, could you see the Royal Navy a bit of it becoming Scottish Navy? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I don't see it, but. And uh, it's quite interesting. I always think if you talk about the armed forces, it becomes a slight reality check in everyone's minds. And that reality check, I think, does actually, in my own opinion, leave us firmly on the UK square as opposed to the breakup of the UK. I think that reality check is a really good way of saying when you do interact with the armed forces community is not just on things like Scottish, um, the Scottish referendum debate, 
but on all sorts of societal conversations, you tend to get quite an honest and a good gauge of opinion from the armed forces community. And indeed, that's why I'm completely obsessed in ensuring that the armed forces community do stand up and serve again and look at public life. You're, you've obviously got a wide range of experience at various levels of government. What do you think is a, is a really good attribute of the armed forces community in terms of that transfer of skills and values into politics, would you say? Well, I'll tell you one, which I have found massively encouraging is that I am the least promoted person, proud private soldier in the Chamber of the House of Commons. We have Colonel Bob Stewart, DSO, Distinguished Service Order, which, you know, they don't fall off trees. That is a, that's a gallantry medal. We have Tobias Elwood. We have a number. But when there's a debate about the armed forces, it's quite interesting that we almost by default tend to agree across the chamber about what should be done, what's, what's right, what's wrong. And that is really good to see in politics. In other words, maybe it's because of military training, but people tend to say, no, no, hang on, that's quite correct. The right honorable gentleman opposite. And even today, when you saw Mr. Healy, the Labour shadow defense secretary, and the exchange of him and Ben Wallace, you could see there was a sort of a meeting of minds. Now, not to say you shouldn't have disagreements, of course you should, but um, I think that's one hugely encouraging thing. And I think that is due to the fact you've got a number of people, not many, sadly. If you, if you look at the House of Commons 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the number of people of any military experience whatsoever has fallen dramatically. It really is just a handful now. Um, uh, but, and the other thing, just to sort of remind you, is when I made my very, very first speech as defence spokesman for the Dems, I said something like, Mr. Speaker, I just think I should tell the House, or tell them that I had uh, some slight experience as a member of the uh, Armed Forces and Territorial Army. And there was a lot of here, 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 here around the chamber, which took me by surprise. And it's interesting, interesting. Um, whereas I suppose if you said, um, you know, I, I don't know of any other profession where you would get that actually. Uh, the number of doctors, number of lawyers. I think if you say, I like to I'm in the chamber, I'm a lawyer, there might be groans because people, oh God, lawyers, you know. So I think the fact that we get on well together across the chamber, I think bodes well for, for our, our personnel because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. It's not the kit because if the kit gets blown up or damaged, that's one thing. But we're talking about human lives and, and, and protecting them uh, as best you can, then that's the most important thing. Absolutely. I think, uh, Jamie, that's been an absolutely amazing insight into your work, into your opinions and views and a, a little bit of an insight into your career as well. We're enormously grateful for your time today and chatting to us and our li and listeners will benefit from this conversation. Um, is there one sort of golden snippet of advice that you say to anyone that comes up to you reluctantly and says, oh, do you know what? I fancy being a politician or a, a local councillor. Uh, or even, dare I say, an MP or an MSP, what was that golden piece of advice you'd give? So my golden piece of advice is, have a go. Uh, don't worry if you make a mistake, because, um, you know, it, we all make mistakes. And sometimes what I do is I, I refer them back uh, to something I've never yet actually told the Chamber of the House of Commons. But when I joined the TA, I was sent on my recruits course, a two-week course, uh, to Barry Button outside Dundee. And, you know, it was uh, square bashing and all that jazz and so on. Uh, on the first Saturday, uh, we were given a half day off. So I went through to the Rugby International, Scotland, England game at Murrayfield, Edinburgh. I got, uh, I drank too much and I didn't make it back by 10 o'clock on the Saturday night. And when I turned up Sunday morning with one hell of a hangover, I was arrested and put in the nick in the glass house. So I was the only recruit on my recruits course who was banged up and left, right, left, right, up before the company commander, fined 40 quid, which is a lot of money then. So whoops a daisy, but it didn't really matter, you know, and in politics, you make mistakes. But what my advice is, if you think you've got it in you, have a go, why not? You never know what might be around the corner. And am I not the living example of a man who accidentally became an MP? You never know. I think so, but what a good accident. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's been absolutely fascinating and enjoyable. And we'll speak again. 
Been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to our guests and thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe now. Alternatively, you can support our mission by checking out in the show notes below where you can rate, donate or become our mate. Thank you.